The green belt. What does it make you think of in terms of landscape character? Places is what I think of, which are either bucolic, beautiful, rustic, or sublime and expansive. Uh, the Surrey Hills, the, the Chilterns, Epping Forest, sublimity, Dartford Marshes, uh, Raynham Marshes, great expansive industrial landscapes. Interesting. I tend to think more in terms of land uses. And so woodland, sometimes well managed, sometimes not well managed. Farmland, much of it now used for horses. Footpaths, some of them terrific, but others, narrow corridors between chain link fence. Parkland, managed by local authorities. And golf courses. And some semi derelict land suffering what looks like deliberate neglect in the hopes of getting planning permission for something valuable. Remember that semi-derelict land, if neglected, uh, can become forest. It's a very good thing that the Landscape Institute is having a discussion about the Green Belt and intends to come up with some proposals for it. And in their initial paper, I very much like this collection of quotations about the Green Belt. Some of them, for example, the CPRE, saying what a wonderful thing it is. But others, sadly, saying that it needs to be developed for London housing. To develop on greenfield site is cheaper for the house builder and is more expensive for the community because it's a community which would have to provide the roads, the railways, the schools, the infrastructure uh, that would then service uh, such housing. Let's turn to look at the history of the Green Belt. And it seems to me that there are really two histories. One of them is the history of ideas about containing the growth of London. And I think that can quite rightly begin with William Petty, who was a, a statistician and predicted how much London was going to grow. But there's another Greenbelt history, which is the history of its amenity use for, for conservation, for fresh air, for woodland, etc. And I think that is best traced to John Claudius Loudon's 1829 plan for what he called zones of country or breathing zones about lo around London. And his idea was that London should expand until one of the zones touched the sea by means of al alternating rings of built development and country development. I think it was a great plan, and since Loudon was instrumental in the adoption of the term landscape architecture, I think it's quite right for the Landscape Institute to place him at the start of Greenbelt history in that sense. The next stage in the development of the Greenbelt is Ebenezer Howard's Garden City Plan of 1898, and he was interested in all those uses. If you look at Howard's plan, it's not just preserved countryside, it's got all sorts of uses, cow pastures, allotments, new forests, small holdings, children's cottage homes. It's a zone for the use of Londoners. After Unwin, we have Abercrombie's brilliant open space plan of 1943 to 4, which envisaged both a green belt round London and a network of green corridors within London so that, in his words, it becomes possible for the town dweller to get from doorstep to open country through an easy flow of open space from garden to park, from park to parkway, from parkway to green wedge and from green wedge to green belt. Wonderful plan. In short, the, the merits of the green belt are that it exists it's an active uh, planning policy, which has continued through changes of government. It contains scenery of great beauty and value. It gives a physical definition for London. It contains a wealth of natural capital. It seems to me that the Green Belt's been much stronger on stopping things happen than it has on encouraging things to happen. Do you agree with that? Yes, I, I do. Uh, it's largely been a, a negative policy which can lead to uh, the problems of neglected land that you uh, discussed earlier. And uh, one of the, our ambitions should be to, 
to change Greenbelt policy to, pri to being primarily uh, a positive uh, policy, um, providing clean air for London, flood relief, and particularly promoting passive recreation in addition to active recreation. The sports lo lobby always promote uh, active recreation. Most people undertake some sort of passive recreation. Architectural and landscape conservation is another element because they can have a great educational uh, value. Turning our attention back to the green land, I particularly admire the work which a firm of landscape architects, land use consultants, did for the city of Coventry. They studied each parcel of land to see what contribution it made to the five green belt objectives. And then they made proposals for conservation and for what they called enhancement initiatives. And I think that's what needs to be done. There's the old principle that William H. White gave us that if you don't use it, you're in danger of losing it. My proposal would be a national park for London's green belt. Make the whole of the, the green belt into one uh, national park with planning powers, obviously. The green belt needs leadership, coordination and funding. And one way of doing that would be a national park authority. It also needs detailed survey analysis and plans for each parcel of green belt land to enhance biodiversity, visual quality, public access to the countryside. Another thing that a coordinating body could do is the encouragement of volunteer inputs. This could come from charitable trusts. It often strikes me that the National Trust are very much better landowners than local authorities. They're far better at looking after both woodland and pasture and habitats. And then there's enormous scope for the involvement of conservation volunteers in the Green Belt. And also I'd like to see an involvement of pro bono landscape architecture work. Our profession should do some things for money, which they do, but other things for love. And that could well include a leadership role in enhancing green belt land. Do you think that's possible? Make a landscape plan for London's green belt. Good point to conclude.